So one of Klaus Wilkie's recommendations for that um, this plot here of Facebook and Google and Microsoft and Apple's stocks was to, instead of use a legend, put the actual text on the plot. And that's actually a great recommendation. It's fairly easy to do with ggplot. Um, and so that's what we're going to cover in this next section is how you do that. Um, you've done it in a few of your past um, assignments. Um, yesterday when we talked about slope graphs, you used geom text and we even used geom text repel to get the labels of the slope graphs not overlapping with each other. Um, and so what we're going to talk about is the three general ways you can get text onto a plot. Um, the first is you can label the actual data points. And so you can do this with geoms like geom text, geom label, geom text repel, geom label repel. Those are kind of the four main ones that you can work with. You can also add arbitrary annotations. And so you can put text wherever you want on a plot and you use the annotate function for that. And then the final way, which you've had lots of experience with actually, is to add labels and titles and subtitles and captions. And the easiest way to do that is with the labs function, where you can specify if you want a subtitle on your plot, you say labs subtitle equals whatever. If you want to change the x-axis, you put x equals whatever. If you want to change the title of the fill legend, then you say fill equals whatever. So those are the three general ways. Um, so what we're going to do is walk through a few examples of each of these uh, different methods. And then in the lesson for today, it'll be an interactive lesson like you've had before, and it'll help you um, see which arguments you can change and how you can add specific points on different parts of the plot. And it'll give you some practice with this. And then in your exercise, you'll also get more practice doing this. Um, so you can label actual data points. And the way you do this is you use geom text, and it has to have, um, in order for it to line up with a point, you can assign it an an X aesthetic and a Y aesthetic, so it shows up on your X and Y plot. But the important part is it has a separate new aesthetic called label. And that label comes from a column in the data set. And so this is our Gapminder data, where we have a column for year, we have a column for country, we have a column for GDP per capita and life expectancy. And so if we map our country column to the label aesthetic, when we use geom text, it'll actually put the value that's in that column onto the plot. And so we can see that that point is definitely Denmark, that's Ireland, Portugal, Slovenia. Um, this is, it's helpful because now we know that's Ireland. But once we get into this world, this is Griffinlandum. Like, I have no idea what, what countries there are there. Everything is just crashing together. So it's not great when you have lots of data points. Um, an alternative to geom text is geom label. The only difference with geom text and geom label is that geom label has a border around it and it has kind of a fill area. You can actually map things onto the fill aesthetic here. You could um, have each of these labels be filled with a different continent. Um, you can have them filled by population. You can have them filled by whatever, um, just like points and just like other geoms that we stick on there. Um, with text, you can't fill it. You can color these. Um, each of these, these labels could be colored with a different color for continent or some other variable we have in there. Um, geom label is nice because the things are pretty, but now we can't even see the points anymore. Like the Denmark, we still have geom point, but the Denmark label is right on top of it. The point is like under the M there. We can't see it, um, which is a problem. We want to be able to like see the data and we're hiding it there. So one solution to this is to repel the labels. And we do this with a, a package called ggrepel, which gives us a new geom called geom text repel. It works exactly the same as geom text. We have to give it a label aesthetic. Um, but what it does internally is it uses some fancy random shuffling algorithm to make it so none of the text labels will touch each other and will be on top of each other. And so in this, we had a big crashing issue here with Greece and Finland and Belgium and stuff. It's now kind of exploded that out and it draws lines if things are too far away. So Greece is that point and Finland is that point. And Austria is down at that point. Serbia is down here. Montenegro is that point. Um, and it's a lot easier to read. It's still very busy. Um, I would not publish something like this. This is helpful if you're just doing kind of quick analysis of something. If you make a scatter plot and you have an outlier and you want to know what outlier that is, 
Um, you can add geom text repel. It'll throw all of the points on there, but then you can kind of look and say, oh, it's some country. And then you can take geom text repel off because you're not going to actually plot every single um, point label because that's going to get messy. Um, so geom text repel looks like that. There's also a geom label repel where it uses the label shape. So you, you have this, this border with the rounded corners and you have the fill area and it works just the same. Um, none of those labels are overlapping. If it has to happen, it does. We have the United Kingdom on top of France and Netherlands on top of Belgium. Um, but it tries its hardest to not overlap anything. And so that's one solution to this. It works really well if you don't have a ton of points. This is probably too many. Um, this is from the Gapminder data. I, I had to subset it so it was just Europe. And even just looking at Europe, we still have way too many points. Um, and so it's, it's helpful. It's good in situations where you don't have a ton of things. Um, in the example yesterday for comparisons, when we did the slope graphs, um, we used geom text repel and that worked because we were only working with like eight countries. And so we had eight different labels that we were shifting around and that, that worked. But once you get beyond like a lot of points, then it, it's going to be messy. So an alternative, instead of repelling all of the labels, is to not use so many labels and to, to only label some of the points. And the easiest way to do this in R is to actually make a, um, a column for the things that you want to um, highlight. And so you can generally make an indicator variable that is like true or false. Um, and so in this case, I make a column that says should be labeled. And this is going to be true if it's one of these countries. So I want to only label Albania, Hungary, and Norway because I do. And so it's going to make a new column in our data set called should be labeled. It's true if it's any of those countries and it's false if it's not. So then when I actually plot this, um, I still use the Gapminder data set for Europe, still mapping GDP per capita and life expectancy, still using geom point. But if you look at geom label repel, there's one thing that's new here. And it's, we specified a different data set. Um, we're not using the full Gapminder data set now. Um, we are using a filtered version of the Gapminder data set where we're only keeping the rows where should be labeled equals true. So it's only going to have those three rows, which means when it plots it, it's only going to plot the labels for those three rows. And so it's really just doing a subset of our data and putting the labels on that way, um, which is a pretty efficient way of getting everything on there. We still have to specify the country label aesthetic. We don't have to redo the X and the Y because we have it up in ggplot. So even though we're switching to a different data set, it's still going to use the same X and Y aesthetic. Um, and so it works pretty well like that. And so now we only have those three labels because we did a specific subset of our data to, to show that. Another solution, a version of this, a better version of this, is you can actually do multiple different aesthetics on here. Right now, this is just, we have a label there, but we can also map other aesthetics. So here, we're still using that Gapminder Europe. Um, because we have a column in there that is mostly false and it's only true for a few countries, we can color the points by that, by that column. And so most of the points are going to be false and then three of the points are going to be true. And if you look down in this section here, I used scale color manual to change the colors. So if it is false, it's going to use this 50% gray. And if it is true, then it's going to be red. And so you can see these three red points. Um, they're picking up that color because of that column that we made called should be labeled. Um, then we're using geom repel like we did before, where we're using a subset of our data and only looking at the three rows that should be labeled. But then we're also mapping a fill aesthetic to the label. So that's why it, instead of having these labels be white like they were before, now they're filled with red. Um, and then I change the text color to white so that it's easier to read instead of having this, the black text on the dark red, that's harder to see. So if we color it white, um, that makes a much nicer looking label. It de-emphasizes these points, it emphasizes those, those three countries there, and it looks generally a lot better than kind of this plot here where everything's black and white. Um, this is gray and red and looks a lot nicer. And all we really had to do is change a couple aesthetics um, to get that to happen, which is cool. This process for highlighting specific parts of a data set 
works even when you're not working with text. For instance, um, if we look at this plot, this is life expectancy for all of the countries in the Gapminder dataset from 1950 to 2000. And this is plotting like 180 different countries, 160 different countries all at once. And it's, um, it's a lot. And so what we ended up doing here um, to make it more interpretable and make it more like tell a specific story is I made a new data set called Gapminder Highlighted and added a new column here for is Oceania. And so this is just going to be true if the country is in Oceania and it's false if it's not. And because we now have a column that shows if it's in Oceania or not, we can use that column as one of the aesthetics. So we can color the lines by that is Oceania aesthetic. And I even do sizing by is Oceania, which means um, if you look down in color or scale color manual and making the rows that are false, so not Oceania, those are 70% gray or super light. And the ones that are in Oceania are red. And so we see those lines there. So this is Australia and New Zealand going up at the top here. They're both growing over time. With scale size manual, I make it so anything that is not Oceania is only a 0.1. So they're very thin gray lines here. But these two lines that are Australia and New Zealand, I made them thicker with 0.5. So it, it kind of makes those lines even bigger and easier to see in this plot. Um, and so even though there's no text here, what this shows is that the same principle is if you can, in your data set, if you can make some sort of column um, for like indicating the things you want to highlight, then you can fill or you can fill by that color by that column or you can color by that column. You can map that column onto some aesthetic and show just those things you want to highlight. Um, and it makes makes it easier to communicate some sort of story using a whole bunch of data all at once. Um, so that's that's a it's an easy strategy to use um, to think about just making new columns as indicator variables that you can then map onto things to highlight things. There's also a package, I think it's called GG Highlight, that makes it easier for you to do this. I haven't used it though, because ultimately with GG Highlight, um, you can use like specific geoms to highlight things, but you still have to use a logical test. So you still have to say, highlight these lines if it's in Oceania. And so you have to look at the documentation for GG Highlight to figure out how you specify that test. And I just find it easier to make um, to make a smaller data set like this or to make a variable like this just because um, I'm used to mutating things and used to doing stuff like that. And so it's easier for me to just do that in a data set and then plot a subset of the data set rather than figuring out the exact syntax for GG Highlight. But if you want to figure out GG Highlight, be my guest, go do it. Um, it looks like a really cool package and so you should try it. Okay, so that's how you label actual data points. Um, and you can map variables that are in your data set, like an actual column, and you can put that on the data or on the plot. The second way to include text on a plot is to add it arbitrarily anywhere you want on the plot using a function called annotate. So the way this works is you add it to the whole stack of all the other functions you have, like plus scales, plus labs, plus whatever. You can add an annotate layer. And this takes a few specific arguments here. First, you have to tell it what kind of geom you want to add. So if we want to add text, then we say add a text geom onto the plot. Then we have to tell it how it's going to plot that geom. So with text, to get it to show up on the plot, we need to give it a y or an x value, a y value, and a label. So that it knows where to put the label on the plot and it knows what to actually put on the plot. So here we just say put the x value at 40,000. So that means it's going to go right here. And so the middle of that text is going to be at 40,000. Have the y value be 76, which is going to be right there. And have the label be some text. And so now we have some text floating around there at that point. Um, and so that was just some arbitrary text that we stuck on the plot. And that works pretty well. In real life, you probably don't want to just stick text there for fun. You can actually enhance the, the interpretation of this thing. Um, GDP per capita is fairly widespread and people understand what it means, but it might be helpful to put some text down in the bottom corner that says like richer countries and then put some text up in the top corner that says older or longer lifespan countries or something like that to help the reader interpret what happens as you're moving along these axes. Again, with life expectancy, that's fairly easy to 
interpret. We know what life expectancy is. But if it's a if it's a weirder variable, um, like the change in odds, um, if you're doing some sort of like uh, regression model and like um, you want to help the reader interpret what happens as you move things up and down, that's a good instance of sticking an, an annotate layer somewhere and getting extra information on the graph. Um, instead of using geom text or geom equals text, we can use the label geom. So the only thing we change here is we switched it from text to label, and now it's going to use our fancy label thing with the rounded corners instead of just text. Any geom that you can make will work as an annotate layer. So if you really wanted, you could add a point at any point you want. This is like super evil. Don't do this. Um, this is what it looks like. We now have a new data point at 40,076. That's not actually a point in the data. That's just a point that we drew on there arbitrarily. Probably don't want to actually do that. Um, that that's a, a bad evil example, but it, it shows that you can just you just change the point here and as long as you get the aesthetics, like it's actually ignoring this label thing because points don't have labels. So it's really just looking at the X and the Y and it's putting it there. If we want to add like a point range, we can say geom equals point range, and then we have to include whatever is required by point range, which would be x min and x max and x and y, or y min, y max, and y and x. If we include all of those there, then we'll get a point range randomly placed on the plot, um, which probably not super helpful, but it's possible. Um, where this is more helpful is you can actually add shapes. Um, so there's a geom called geom underscore rect, um, that lets you draw rectangles, and um, it's kind of a version of geom tile that you've been working with for heat maps. Um, so to draw a rectangle, you need to specify an x min and an x max, and a y min and a y max, uh, which are the corners of the rectangle, and then it will fill in the rest of the rectangle for you. And so here, we're just adding an arbitrary rectangle onto the plot. Um, Using So starting at 30,000, going up to 50,000, starting at 78, going up to 82. So there's kind of the area we drew that rectangle in. We fill it with red. We make it transparent so you can see the dots under it. And so that's one way that you can use to highlight a specific area of your graph. And so we can say this top corner here, these are the richer countries with high life expectancy. Um, and so now we're highlighting that. What we can also do is you don't have to just use one annotate layer. You can use a whole bunch of annotate layers. So here are three different annotate layers all added on to um, show the rectangle. Um, we have a label and we use geom segment um, to draw a line segment. So here we have to give it a starting X and an ending X and a starting Y and an ending Y. Um, if you notice, the starting and ending x are the same because it's just starting at 40,000, going up to 40,000. It didn't move side to side. Um, and then there's actually an argument to geom segment for an arrow. And so you can control kind of the width and the shape and the angle of that arrowhead. You can do all sorts of things. You can make it a curvy arrow. There's um, documentation for how to do that. Um, you can do all sorts of cool annotations on your plot just using this annotate layer. And so this is a good thing to do. Um, if you're trying to make a good plot for kind of a more public facing type of publication, like a think tank report or an annual report for a nonprofit or something, um, and you want to annotate specific things or highlight specific things, if you have a coefficient plot, you could add kind of a label annotation thing and point to one of your specific significant coefficients and say, this is our main finding or, or something um, to kind of help the reader understand what's going on in the graph. So that's how you use the annotate function. Um, again, you just tell it how you want it to be drawn, if it's a rectangle or a label or a point or a line or whatever, and then you specify all of the parts that it needs to draw that, um, that geom. So with rectangles, it needs those arguments. With labels, it needs those arguments. The way you know what arguments you need to include is you go to the documentation. If you go to the ggplot website or you go to the help file in R, um, and look at geom text or geom point or geom segment and scroll down, it will tell you, uh, it'll have a list of all of the aesthetics you can use. And the bolded uh, aesthetics in that list are the ones that are required that you must include for the geom to actually draw. So as long as you include all of the required ones, you will get some arbitrary geom on your plot.
Okay, the third way to include text on a plot is the easiest um, because it's the one you've been working with the most. It is adding titles and subcap or titles and subtitles and captions and access labels and stuff. Um, the way you do that is with the labs function. And you've been using that throughout the semester so far. Um, one important reason we cover this here is um, to get at this point by the Klaus Wilkie made with these two different graphs here. So if you look at this plot here, um, there's no title to the plot. Instead, the title is down here in the caption. And this is because the style guide of this publication said that all of the caption or all of the, the plot information needs to be included as a text-based caption to the plot. And so this, this stuff here isn't actually part of the plot. This is text that is in a separate document. And so when he made this plot, all he gave them was the picture here ending kind of at the bottom here. None of this is in there. So there's that version of the plot, but there's also this version of the plot, which is the same data, everything's the same in the middle, but now there's a title and a subtitle and a caption. And there's no figure 22.1 caption down below. And so what Klaus Wilkie asks in his book is, which one of these is better? And his answer is neither. Um, it depends on where you're putting the thing. Um, if you're working with a publication, a, a journal or a think tank report or an annual report or something, and their style has actual text-based captions under all of the pictures, then do that. Don't include all of the extra title and subtitle and caption information because then it's going to be super redundant when you include the exact same information underneath. But if you're working with a publication that doesn't do that or gives you the option to not do it, then do something like this. If you're trying to do a standalone picture that would potentially go on a blog, or if you want to have a, a cool tweetable or um, postable um, image, then you're going to want to have more information in here because this is part of the plot at this point, this corruption in human development title. That is not text that is in the document. That's something that is embedded directly in the plot. And so if this thing gets shared around on social media, it has all of the information and the data sources and everything that you need. If this thing does, who knows where that data came from? Who knows what the title is? Who knows how you're supposed to try to interpret it? But in a book, you're going to have the figure uh, or the figure caption and all the details down there. And so choose what is most appropriate for the, the document type that you're creating. And that's, that's kind of the main guidelines there. So those are the three basic ways of adding text to ggplots. And you'll get lots of practice with this, with the lesson and with the exercises. Um, but before we do that, let's briefly talk about one kind of technical thing that will help you make more consistent plots. Um, so let's talk about seeds.